So we begin here in just a moment. If you would open up your bulletins, please, and take out the communication sheet. Uh, would love to see your prayer requests or anything that you would like to put on there. Uh, it'd be great to hear from you. The elders pray for you every Thursday when we get together. Secondly, I want to encourage you to go ahead and take out your teaching notes, if you would. And this is going to be one of those messages today that uh, can be challenging. It's going to be good to go back and look through those notes and see what's said and do some of the research yourself. Now, I'm still hearing that popping up here, and I don't know where that was coming from. So if anyone on the worship team can isolate that, maybe they can talk to the sound team. And uh, we can go ahead and take care of that. Would you please stand as we read God's Word? Today I'm going to be reading from Romans chapter 8, and I'm going to begin with verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. For whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom He predestined, these He also called, whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. And Lord, I just pray right now that as we go into this topic, that you would speak to each and every one of our hearts. Lord, I thank you for your word. And I thank you for the incredible teachings and comfort that we can find in your, in your word. And we just give you praise and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I remember when I was growing up in school, and maybe some of you have been, can remember the same, who we were a little older and been around for a while, but I remember when the topic of evolution came up, that when the teachers would teach the topic to us, what they would say is the theory of evolution, the theory of creation. And, you know, and we, we would, at least the majority of us here, I'm sure, would disagree on, on the theory of creation because we believe in the creation of God, that God literally created the heavens and the earth. But my point is, is, is that they used to teach both aspects of that. But in recent years, there's been a major change, hasn't there? In fact, now in school, what we're hearing about is the fact of evolution. And what we're hearing about, well, what we're not even hearing about is the quote-unquote theory of creation. In fact, anyone who takes that position of creation publicly in a school classroom today stands the, the real possibility of being mocked by their teacher in front of their uh, other classmates out there. And what's happening is we're watching and all of a sudden what should be presented first and foremost is God created the heavens and the earth, but now it's gotten to the point where they don't even, don't even present both sides. And as we see that, it's become a very one-sided debate, a very one-sided argument. And I say all of that to say this, that a similar situation has happened over the years, even within the church body, as we get to this very, very vital text that we're going through today. In fact, this week as I've been studying for, for the message, I've been reminded just how important this passage is for us to, to have comfort in the faith in which we have. And there's been different opinions in this area. In fact, i got to tell you, just the, the word predestination, the word foreknowledge, the fur is going up on some of the back of your necks right now because you're going to say, which position is he going to come from? And people get really fired up in this area. But I want to encourage you that as we go through this, that you become familiar with both sides, that you become familiar with why people believe what they believe and then when you hear the evidence that you yourselves make your own decision. One of the ways that I like to teach is when you, when you hit a real controversial area, I'll go ahead and I'll lay it out. If there's multiple sides, I'll lay it out. But it's up to you to make the decision as to what you believe. I'll share what I believe. I'll share why I believe it. But I'm not going to pound down on people that it's going to become even a divisive matter in, in that particular area. But I think it's absolutely critical that we take note right at the beginning right now what is the verse that precedes this text, verses 29 and 30, in which are called the golden chain of salvation? What is the verse that comes up right before it? We see Revelation, or Revelation, we see Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. You stop and think about it, say, all things. God, you don't understand what I'm going through in my life right now. You don't understand the problems I'm having with this person or that person or 
your job or whatever it might be, your health. God, you can't possibly understand. And yet we find out in the Word of God that God comes in here and He says that we know not in some things, but in all things that God is working together for what? For good. He's working together for good. We may not be able to see it right now. I shared last week so often in our lives we hit these times in which these problems come before us that are way too big for us. It's like looking at a mountain right in front of us. All we can see is the mountain. All we can see is the problem. What we can't see is the other side. And as we look over top of that mountain, what we realize is, well, actually, let me back up. On this side of eternity, we can't look over on the other side of that mountain until maybe one of these days we travel to that point. But God sees that right now. And He's working behind the scenes in ways that we can never, ever imagine. Probably the classic example of, of concurrence in the Scripture is that of Joseph. And when I say concurrence, and I'm talking about the doctrine of concurrence, what we're talking about is two things that are working together at the same time, that we can't see all the way through. We can't see the other side. And Joseph's brothers went ahead and took him, and they did not like him. They were going to get rid of him. In fact, they were going to kill him until it was stopped, and he ends up being put in a pit, and he ends up being sent to Egypt, and they're saying, good, we never want to see him again. Let him go. Get him out of here. And from all points of view at that point, it would seem that, that the brothers who had so much evil in mind for Joseph had succeeded. And yet behind the scenes, God was at work to take Joseph and to put Joseph in a position where he would save the nation from starvation, that he would be out there to minister to his brothers, that he would come down as one of the greatest individuals in all history as we look back at Joseph and the way that he reacted. The ultimate example of concurrence where evil is happening on the one side and good is happening on the other side is the cross of Jesus Christ. You know, you look at the crucifixion of Christ and Satan thought he had his greatest victory in all of that. The people who came against Christ thought they had their greatest victory in all of that as they put Christ on the cross and crucified him. Done! He's dead. And yet we find out that the cross is really a paradox. A paradox is a seeming contradiction that under closer scrutiny, we find out that it is no contradiction at all. On the one hand, what we see is the cross was the most horrible, ghastly event that humanity ever did in the history of the world as they crucified the sinless, the only begotten Son of God on the cross to death. On the other hand, it was the most beautiful act that ever occurred as God's Son went to the cross, died on the cross for our sins so that we could be forgiven and that we can have new life. You see that doctrine of concurrence that's working together at the same time. Maybe something happens that would seem to be really bad on the one side, but on the other side, God has promised that He's going to be working for our good. Now what I have to ask you is this promise in Romans 8.28, is this promise for everybody Absolutely not. Do you see what it says? Let's read the rest of it. And we know that all things work together for good. For, for who? To those who love God. To those who are the called according to His purpose. And so there's a second thing that we need to see in there, and that, that is that God has a purpose in the circumstances that we're going through. But the question is, who are the called? Who's, who's this referring to? It's referred to the believer in Christ. Those are the called that are being referred to here. And in fact, if you look down a little bit further on here to verse 33, and it says, it gets even more specific, it says, who shall bring charge against God's elect? Who are the called? The called are God's elect. The calls are those, the called are those who believe in Jesus Christ. And with this verse here, which is such an encouragement to each and every Christian, the very next verse goes into to lay the foundation for why no matter what it is that you're facing in your life, that you can have hope and the Christian can hang in there. Verse 29 goes on and it says, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. So the first word that pops up here is this word foreknew or foreknowledge. And what does it mean to, to foreknow? Well, what it means is it just need, means to know beforehand. That, that something is known ahead of time. And so as we look at this golden chain of, of salvation, we see that the very first thing that pops up here is that word foreknowledge, and it means to know beforehand. There's another verse in the Bible that talks very similar to this scripture that we're looking at right now, and that passage is in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. It says, Peter, 
an apostle of Jesus Christ to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, uh, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. So once again, when this word foreknowledge is used, right here you've got foreknowledge, immediately after it you've got predestination. When you look in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, you've got that word foreknowledge, and right there as well, in fact, right in front of it, is the word elect. We get an idea of what's going on, and it's a very difficult subject to comprehend, and I'm going to get into that a little bit deeper later on. But as we look at this golden chain of salvation, the very first thing here to come up is foreknowledge, or foreknew, that God foreknew. Now, when we ask about foreknowledge, we ask, what does that word mean? What's the concept that's being applied here? Well, this is where it gets really sticky. Because up until this point, Christianity across the board can hang together. But when it gets to the question of how does a person come to faith? How is a person saved? That's when the debates begin Start coming. That's getting into a little more arguments here. There's two primary views of foreknowledge that are out here historically, and I'm just going to lay them both out for you. The first one here is the prescient view. Now, you see in the, the, the prefix here, you've got pre, which means before, and then if you look at the word there, you can see part of the word science, which is knowledge. And it means to know beforehand. And the prescient view is by far the most popular view today. It's not the view that Martin Luther had, not the view that John Calvin had, it's the view that Philip Melanchthon, who was Luther's disciple, who ended up taking over the Lutheran church later on, ended up coming up with. And this is the predominant view today. From all eternity, God knew who would respond to the gospel and predestined them to heaven on that basis. So uh, he knows down the corridors of history who's going to choose on their own to receive him, and those are the ones that he predestines. God does not work faith into their hearts. The classical text that they go to to prove this point is right here in Romans chapter 8, 29. Okay, there's a second view that's out there as well. In fact, let me just say, God, God knows who will choose to believe in him. And that's what we need to remember from, from this particular view here. The second view is the Augustinian, Augustinian view. Some of you have heard of it as the Calvinistic view on here. And that's that God in his grace chose to have mercy on some on others, he chose to allow them to receive the justice they deserve. This is done on the basis of the hidden or the sovereign will of God. Were it not for God's mercy and active involvement in our salvation, we would never believe. In other words, God knows before creation, before the foundations of the world, those that he will choose to have mercy on. And as these two views are laid out, generally when the Augustinian view comes up, that's when the blood pressure begins to rise. And the, the, the statement or the verse that ends up flying out is this verse right here. It comes out in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. And people say, yeah, yeah, but the Lord's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And that is absolutely 100% correct. But I've got to ask you the question. Do people perish? Yeah, people perish. Would you say that even more people end up perishing than are saved from what we see in the world? Yeah, even more people perish than, than, than are saved from what we see in, in the world. Then we have to ask the question from that. Okay, the Bible says that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Has God failed? What do we have to say? Absolutely not. So we need to re-examine the verse and see how all of this fits together. We see the word willing. God is not willing. What we need to understand is that there's three aspects of God's will. Number one, God's will is, is his hidden or his sovereign will. That from all eternity past, God purposed whatever is going to happen. We today can't know what God's hidden will is. You don't know what it is until it comes to play. Uh, until it comes to pass. And so God's hidden will is not for you and me to know. God's sovereign will, which means that he reigns, is for him to know, and we can't possibly understand that he's God, we're not. The second aspect of God's will is God's preceptive will. Where we can't know God's sovereign will, can we know God's preceptive will? 
What that's referring to is the precepts in the Bible. In other words, the, the principles that are laid out in the Bible. Can we know God's preceptive will? Absolutely. You pick up a Bible. Dave talked about it a little earlier on. You know, have, have you ever read the entire Bible? As you go through the Bible, it's God's love letter to us. It's the manual for life, for a better life. And we go and we say, I believe it. But we don't read it. Do we go all the way through and do we read the Bible? Because within the Bible, you've got the precepts or the principles that God has laid out for you and I to have a better life. But there's a third aspect of God's will as well. And that aspect is God's will of disposition. You say, what? What are you talking about, God's will of disposition? What that means is what pleases God. You know, what is it that pleases God? As you look at this passage up here, what would you say? The Lord is not willing that any should perish. Well, in His sovereign will, if He's not willing any should perish, then everybody, we should have universalism. Everybody should come to faith, right? So it can't be that. It's the Lord's willing that not any should perish. Yeah, you see that in God's precepts. But let's look at the third. The Lord is not willing, it is not God's desire that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And that's the answer there when it's talking about the will of God, that it's speaking of God's will of disposition. In other words, it's speaking of what pleases Him. In fact, there's a similar verse, a parallel verse in 1 Timothy 2 that actually uses that word, desires, that it's the desire of God that no one should perish, but that everyone should come to, to repentance, that that gospel is given to everybody. It's offered to everybody to come and to receive. In 1978, I came to the Lord during my time in the army. And it was, it was interesting. I had been raised in a, in a church, in a traditional church all my life. And yet, I did not realize all of that time that I did not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. When I came to that church, uh, the people just loved us into the kingdom, regardless of us. We just, Cheryl and I, we swore like sailors. I mean, we did things that we, we did not, we were not the Christians that we are today. And the people loved us into the kingdom. And I couldn't understand why they were putting on such pressure for us to be baptized immediately. And it wasn't until years later that I found out that they were a pure Arminian church and that they believed in the loss of salvation and that they believed in, in baptismal regeneration, which means you have to be water baptized in order to be saved. And, and that whole process uh, was going on. The, the, the love of the people really touched our hearts and we came to love them and we still love them and we still keep in touch with them all of these days. But I had a situation that happened to me and a friend over 17 years ago came up to me and this is the background that I was raised in and that's why I'm bringing it up. And he challenged me and he said, I want you to find one scripture in the entire Bible that clearly states that fallen man has within himself the ability to choose to be saved. And I said, I will take you up on that. And I gotta tell you, I hated the doctrine of grace. I hated the doctrine of Augustinianism or Calvinism at that time. And I set out on a one year journey, actually that first year, to destroy it. I got my Bible. I began to go through my Bible. I began to highlight every single verse that has to do with salvation. You guys, you guys know how I study. I go very thorough as I go through. And as I made these marks and I went through, my goal was at the end of that time to go back through all of those scriptures and see if there was a pattern. And if there was a pattern, I wanted to see it. But my goal was to destroy it. I ought to be able to find words like choose and choice and everything all over the place. This guy doesn't stand a chance. I got done doing that study and it started me on a study that 17 years later I'm still doing. I've still gone through, I've gone through five Bibles, no fewer than five Bibles, multiple times, marking them up with every single verse that has to do with salvation. That question is embedded in my mind. How is a person saved? How does a person come to, come to salvation? And I'm not going to tell you on here what to believe. In fact, I'm going to encourage you to go and do some study. If you have a concordance, they're about that thick, but if you have a concordance, take every word that has to do with salvation. In fact, let's back up one. Take your Bible, and I encourage you to start going through your New Testament, and every time you see a verse that has to do with salvation, put a mark on it. When you get done, go back and go through those verses and see if you see a pattern. 
Look up words like uh, in the concordance or on your computer Bible program, like saved, save, salvation, for new, for knowledge, uh, predestined, uh, all of these words that have to do with this topic, elect, election, and ask yourself the question, is it God reaching out to man, or is it man choosing God? And I'm not even going to tell you the answer on that. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to challenge you. I don't know how I can be any more fair than that. It's to challenge you to go in and do the research and find that out yourself and see if there's a pattern of fallen man is choosing God or if God is choosing fallen man. And I'm not playing down at all the two aspects of it. There's two sides of the coin. On the one side, you've got the sovereignty of God. On the other side, you've got the free will of man and both are working in that way of concur uh, concurrence. And, and yet to, to explain that is extremely difficult. I'd like to share an illustration from my childhood when I was growing up. Not only did I go to the traditional church the whole time that I was there, uh, my brother went with me. And if you were to know my brother, he is one of the nicest guys around. But he doesn't know Jesus. And he's got no desire for Jesus. We would sit there in church as he was growing up, and he would just sit there and he would sleep because he could not wait to get out of there. It meant absolutely nothing to him. Now for me, I had this pull within me in which I'm listening, and even though I wasn't saved, that, that draw, that, that pull was going on within me. Now, years later, my brother is still in the same position. He's got no desire for the things of God. If you were to look at his Facebook page, you would see a very different lifestyle than the lifestyle in which I live. Now, as we look back on that, let me ask you the question. Does that mean that I was better than my brother because I came to faith in Christ? Does that mean that I was wiser? Does that mean that I was more righteous? Well, you guys know the answer to that, and it is absolutely not. I came to Christ by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. When you look up here and you see me, I don't, want to, I don't want to be on a pedestal, you guys, and I shouldn't be on a pedestal because I'm not even worthy to stand up here. I'm a sinner saved by grace, and you need to realize that. And I don't understand this choosing thing with God. I don't understand how all of this ends up happening. But what I do know is that when God has touched our heart, when God has turned the, the light switch on within our heart, if you would, verses 1, chapter 3, two. 4 say we were dead in our transgressions and our sins until we were quickened in Christ Jesus. That God did something to take that heart of stone and to turn it into flesh. I don't understand it. I just know it's biblical, and I know it is, and that God did it. How should we react to that? Should we say, hey, I received Christ. I'm a little smarter than my neighbor. I'm a little smarter than my brother. A little more. No, it should put us on our faces before God, because there is nothing within us that is worthy of salvation. And it's by the grace and the mercy of God that he's touched our life. And if he has, it ought to change your life forever as we look and we see the, the, the mercy that he had upon us. You know, and this issue has been so divisive over the years, and this is the conclusion that I've come to. This is not worth dividing the body of Christ over. What we do is we look at, the, we look at what's in the scriptures, we try to come to that understanding ourselves, but I, I've come to the conclusion that there's one thing that both sides can agree on. This is where we meet. We meet in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace ye have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. <laughs> so we look at that passage, everyone could say, I agree. Where do we run into trouble? When we take a few steps back and we say, okay, how did I come to faith? And that's where the disagreement comes in. And I'll tell you, we've seen so many churches, we've seen so many friends divided over a doctrine like this. And I encourage that that never, ever happens, whatever it is that you believe, that you at least respect the other individual's side. I can say that for a year, I hated the position that I'm in today until I was absolutely convinced by Scripture that that's what it is. And I want to encourage you to do your own study wherever you come from, be able to back it up from Scripture, realizing that the Scriptures and the Scriptures alone are the authority for what we believe. Well, the second link that we run into here is in, in uh, the golden chain is for, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined 
And then it goes on from there. These he also called. But we go from foreknowledge. So from, from the prescient view, from all eternity past, God foreknew down the corridors of time who it was who on their own merit would choose him to be saved. On the Augustinian or the Calvinistic side, on the other side, from all eternity past, God knew who his chosen or who his elect were. However you interpret it, it goes on to the next one here in which it talks about predestination. Now, i got to ask you, is predestination a biblical concept? Absolutely. In fact, we find the word predestined four times in the New Testament in which that's listed out here. And uh, in the doctrine, we find out there quite a bit as well. Predestined, uh, or predestination, means to mark out. It means to determine beforehand. And as we look at verse 29, what we find out is that God predestined us to two specific things. Do you see what, they're in, what they are in there? Verse 29b says, to be conformed to the image of Christ. What does that mean? Well, that means that we become more and more like Jesus. That means as we read the, God, uh, the Word of God and, and we study Him, uh, we study His Word, we spend time in prayer, that God begins to change us so that we begin to reflect the character and the attributes of God to the people who are around us. But there's a second aspect as well in there, and it says to be conformed to the image of, of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. So here you see that Jesus would be the firstborn among many brethren. That term firstborn has special meaning within the Bible. What that means is the firstborn from the Hebrew concept was the preeminent one. They were the superior one. We are children of God. We've just learned that reading through Romans, that through adoption that we have become the children of God. But that Jesus would be the preeminent one among all of the children of God. And that's basically what's being laid out here in verse 29. Verse 30 says, Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. Well, it says in verse 30, Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. It's interesting that we look at this word call. The word when you translate it in the Greek is more than, Hey, George! George! It's a summoning, come, is what it means in the Greek. That that word call is going to be effectual. When we talk about effectual calling in the Bible, what that means is that that call will take effect exactly the way in which God intended it to do. Although this also refers to the outward call of, God, of the gospel, you know, so the word of God is being shared, here it primarily refers to the internal conversion-producing call of God uh, oops, let me back up. Sorry about that. Uh, so, so let me read it again. It says, although this also refers to the outward call of, of the gospel, here it primarily refers to the internal conversion-producing call of God. In other words, the moving of the Holy Spirit in the heart of a believer. R.C. Sproul says, if we are believers today, it's not because we made God's effectual, uh, not because we made God's call effectual in our lives. It is because God did it. We are called according to his purpose. Let me ask you this. If we are the one, and there's a responsibility here. Where you've got, we've got to choose to receive Christ. But something has to happen in our hearts before we end up doing that. But if we're on our own merit out there and we choose to receive Christ, who gets the glory? We do. But if God works in our hearts, preparing us and drawing us to Christ, who gets the glory? God does. And we always want to be in that position to realize that it's God who gets the glory and not us. And so, whom he called, these he also justified. This, once again, is referred to the, the internal or the effectual call of God in regards to salvation. But that word justification, we've been talking about that in our study to Romans. There's three aspects in our salvation. Our justification, remember that comes at the moment of salvation. That comes as God declares the guilty sinner not guilty. That's the moment we usually think of when we're thinking of being saved. We come to the point where we receive Jesus Christ, we're saved. Well, it goes a bit further that we are now justified, that we as guilty sinners are declared righteous. And as God looks at us, he sees us as he sees Jesus. But in this golden chain of salvation, there's one critical word that's missing here. And that word is sanctification. Sanctification begins the moment we trust Christ as our Savior and lasts for the rest of our lives, all the way until the Lord returns or until we, are, or until we go home. 
to eternity. For some reason, uh, Paul didn't include that in here, but he's got the word justification. The very next word that comes in here is the word glorified, and uh, or glorification. Glorification is that moment in which the Lord turns, or that moment in which we go home to heaven, and all of a sudden, the sin nature that we've been fighting for all of our lives, we're delivered from it. Where in the first with justification, we're delivered from the penalty of sin. In sanctification, we're delivered from the power of sin within our lives. In glorification, we are delivered from the presence of sin. Praise the Lord. And the exciting thing is, as you look at this golden chain of salvation, look at the words on here. You see what happened? Foreknew, predestined. It goes on here, called, justified, and then glorified. Do you see that everything is in the past tense? So sure is our salvation when we come to Christ. So sure are all of these things. It's not in the present tense. It's, it's in the past tense. In, in other words, God is not constrained by time like you and I are. God can see through all eternity. and Everything's done so sure is the salvation of the believer that everything is laid out here in the past tense. And it's with that background that we go into the encouraging verses in verses 31 through 39. <clears throat> what then shall we say of these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Well, what things is it talking about? It's talking about God working in your heart for salvation. What about these things? And if God is for us, and interestingly enough, literally, that can mean since God is for us, uh, says here in, in, uh, in 31, if God is for us, then who can be against us? Do you realize that no matter what it is that you're facing within your life, that God plus us is a majority? You know, I mean, we can seem like we're out there on our own, but when, when God is involved, God plus us, plus us, is a majority. Verse 32 of Romans 8 says, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall we not with him also freely give us all things? It's interesting that one of the words in here relates right back to Genesis chapter 22. You remember the story back there? God had promised Abraham a child, the, the child of the promise. And in, in the meantime, what did he do? Abraham goes out and he listens to his wife, and he gets the handmaiden and ends up getting her pregnant. And he's got a son. But when God begins talking about the son of promise, it's the only son. And in Genesis chapter 22, after, after Abraham had been waiting for 25 years in order to have this promise fulfilled, we want our promises filled now. We don't want to wait 10 days from now. We don't want to wait a year from now. We want it now. God told Abraham, I'm going to give you a son. And not only am I going to give you a son, but this son is going to lead a nation that's going to be like the stars of the sky, like the sand of the seashore. And in Genesis chapter 22, the unthinkable happens because God goes to Abraham and he says, Abraham, I want you to take your son, your only son, Isaac, and I want you to take him to three days to Mount Moriah, and I want you to sacrifice him there. We find out that Abraham didn't sleep very well that, that night because he was up and he was cutting the wood, I think, and getting everything ready. I just get the feeling he didn't sleep well at all. And in the morning, he took two servants with him. As they got the servants and he got Isaac, we know that Isaac was a little bit uh, bigger than the young child that we see so often in our Sunday school lessons because Isaac carried the wood. Okay. The way the wood. Okay. Isaac carried the wood to go up there. And they're walking up towards Mount Moriah. They're heading on this three-day journey. And, and Isaac's looking and he says, Dad, he says, I see the fire, I see the wood, where's the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham says, Isaac, God will provide the lamb. And they go ahead and they continue on up here, and Abraham gets there knowing fully what's going to happen. He tells his servants to stay down, and they end up staying back there. And he goes up to the top of the mountain with, with Isaac. And as he gets up there on Mount Moriah, which is believed to be Mount Calvary up in that area, he goes ahead and builds an altar. And they put the wood around, and he binds the son. And he lays the son upon the altar. And Abraham gets the dagger. And as he's getting ready to come down with the dagger upon his son and plunge it into him, the angel of the Lord cries out, Abraham, Abraham, don't lay a hand on the boy. 
Now I know that you love me. And the question is, did, did God not know something? Or was it really Abraham that needed to see that? And Abraham's got that dagger up. And he's ready to come down to kill his son. And, and the angel of the Lord stops him. And you can bet that dagger went down so quickly. His only son. But I'll tell you what. Years later, on Mount Calvary, perhaps that very same mountain, when God the Father had His dagger up on God the Son, there was nobody to shout, Stop! And that dagger came down in the form of the cross and in the form of nail-pierced hands and nail-pierced feet with the incredible sacrifice that God made for you and for me to be saved. We see in Romans chapter 5, verses 8-10, through 10, it says that God demonstrates His own love toward us. How? In that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. Now with that background, look at verse 32. It says, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall, how, shall he not, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? If well we were enemies with God, that God didn't spare his son. Now that we're children of God, why are we even worried? How much more will God take care of his children than even the enemies of God? And he paid the ultimate price for you and me so that we could be saved. Verse 33, Who shall bring charge against God's elect? It is God who, is, who, who justifies. All of a sudden, the scene shifts to a courtroom. Can you imagine the terror of being on trial for your life? That you know that you had committed a crime that was worthy of the punishment of death, and that you find yourself in the courtroom, you find yourself standing before the judge, realizing that whatever verdict he comes out with could cost you your very life. Can you imagine the panic that you would feel during that time? The incredible thing is, is, is as we look at this, so many people in the Bible believe that the Father is going to be the judge, and yet John tells us that it's Jesus who's going to judge us at that time. John chapter 5, verses 22 2 and 27 say, For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, and has given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. And so, so often we think, oh, it's, it's the Father who's going to be doing all, all of this judgment. And yet we find that judgment has been turned over by the Father to the Son. And now we go back to the courtroom. In fact, if we go one other verse into 1 Timothy, it's, Paul writes, For there is one God, one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. And so now you've got Jesus as the judge, but Jesus is also the mediator. Did we commit a crime that is worthy of death? Absolutely. The soul who sins shall die. And the imagery here is that you're in the courtroom and Satan is pointing his finger at you and he's got all of these, these things that you've done wrong over the course of your life and here's Jesus behind the, behind the bench. But all of a sudden, to our delight, we end up finding out as believers in Christ that the very person who is the judge is also our defense attorney. And he comes around as our advocate. And in Christ, we are forgiven. In Christ, no matter what it is that we have done in our lives, we are made clean. It's an incredible story in Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1, because Joshua, the high priest of Israel, is being accused by Satan. Verse 1 of Zechariah 3 says, Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right side to, to oppose him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Israel rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now, Joshua was clothed in filthy garments and standing before the angel. And then he answered and he spoke to those who stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, See, I have removed your iniquities from you, and I will clothe you with rich robes. And I said, Let them put a clean, and I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on the head. 
imagery here that Joshua the high priest is filthy. He is filled with sin. Is there any doubt about it? I mean, the accusation comes up from Satan standing up there saying, Look at that! He's not worthy to be functioning in the role in which he's functioning with. He's filthy! Joshua says, I'm not dirty. I'm righteous. Is that what he says? No. He stands there in stunned silence. And the angel of the Lord goes to his defense and he says, The Lord rebuke you. The Lord rebuke you, Satan. And then they take off the filthy garments of the priest and they replace them with rich, clean robes. And they take the turban on his head, which covers, interestingly enough, the brain in which we have so many filthy thoughts and everything else that ends up happening. And he does that. And, and it symbolizes that in Christ Jesus, we are saved. We are born again. We are cleansed. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sins. And as God looks at us, he sees us as he sees Jesus. It doesn't mean that our sins have, have gone away. The sins are still there. But we're forgiven of all of our sins. Verse 34 goes on and says here, Who is it who condemns? It is Christ Jesus who died. Furthermore, is also risen, who, who is even at the right hand of God, who also inter makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine? So Paul goes on and he begins to share these hypothetical things that could, that could separate us from the very love of Christ. And, and uh, says, who is he condemned? Is it Christ who died? Furthermore, Christ who is risen. And then it says, even at the right hand of God. In Hebrews chapter 9, verses 24 through 26, it says, for Christ did not enter a man-made sanctuary that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again the way that the high priest entered the most holy place every year with blood that was not his own. Then Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But now he's appeared once for all at the end of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as man is destined to die once and after that to face the judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of Everybody, is that what it says? What does it say? To take away the sins of many, those who trust in Him. And He will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for Him. The entire Old Testament points towards Jesus Christ. The entire Old Testament points towards that ultimate sacrificial work that Christ Himself would end up doing. As Paul goes on in verse 35, let, let me back up one, one second on 34. Uh, there's four reasons here in verse 34 that are listed as to why the born-again believer will never be condemned. And those of you who are wrestling with your, your own assurance of salvation need to see this. Number one is Christ's death on the cross for our sins, that he paid the ultimate penalty. Number two, Christ's resurrection from the dead, that Christ didn't stay in the grave, but God rose him as a mark of accepting the redemptive work of Christ. Number three, Christ's exalted position in heaven at the right hand of God. You see, on the Day of Atonement, year after year, the high priest would go and make offerings for sacrifices, but they didn't sit. They stood because their work was never finished. But in the case of Jesus, once for all, He died for our sins, and He ends up going to heaven, and He's seated at the right hand of God in the position of power, in the position of authority, in the position of might. And then finally... Christ's continual intercession for us on, his, on our behalf in heaven as he's praying for us. I'm hurrying because I'm running out of time and I apologize on that. Verse 30, 36 goes on and it says, as it is written, it says, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Paul goes ahead and he, he quotes Psalm 44, verse 22, out of the LXX, or out of the Septuagint, which is the Greek uh, Old Testament. But he uses it to illustrate that God's people have always suffered while they're in the world. In other places in Scripture, we find that Paul faced death daily from going out and sharing the gospel, that there was suffering that occurred. We find in John chapter 17 that Jesus, in his high priestly prayer, prayed this. I have given them your word, and the, and the world has hated them. But they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, 
but that you protect them from the evil one. They are, uh, they are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. And so we hear that you come to Christ, your life's going to be fantastic after that point. Well, there's a lot of good things that happen after you come to Christ. In fact, there's a lot of incredible things. But one thing that we are promised in the Bible is that if you're living a Christian life, that you will have to undergo persecution. And even when it came to the high priestly prayer of Jesus in the garden, as he's praying, even before he went to his crucifixion here, we find that his prayer for his disciples wasn't that they be taken out of the world. In other words, what's he saying? Not that they're taken out of these difficult situations. But Father, that you would protect them going through them. And you have to ask yourself, why would he pray that? And I have to say to you, because it's through these difficult positions, these, these difficult situations that we go through in our lives that we really grow spiritually. As you look back on the course of your life, you're going to see it's during those hard times that the most growth ended up happening. And that God is at work there and that he's promised to continue to be at work there. Look at verse 37. It says, yet in these things, we are, we are more than conquerors through him who loved, who loved us. You might be thinking, I don't feel like a conqueror. I don't feel like I, I'm going out and I'm, I'm just taking care of all of these challenges that are coming on me. You want to know something interesting? When you go to the Greek, it's not just conquerors. You know what it is? That we as Christians are super conquerors. You say, how can that be? I don't feel like a super conqueror. I feel like a failure with all of these things that I'm going through. Well, we're a conqueror and we're a super conqueror because we have access to us, the power of the Holy Spirit that's at work within us to help us to get through these times. As a Christian, we need to realize that we are in a win-win situation. I mean, there's times that hurt. There's times that really hurt. But we are in a win-win situation. Ultimately, God will see us through. Verses 38 and 39 go on and, and say, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor, depth, nor anything, any other thing created, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul now lists ten things that he is absolutely persuaded will never move us away from the love of Christ. And as you go through here and you look at this, what we find is it covers every aspect of our life. Uh, the earlier verses in, in this particular verse here. But that nothing will be able to separate us from the love of Christ. And he lists all of these things. And we get to that word, no thing will be able to separate us from the love of Christ. Bring it together. Absolutely nothing. No matter what it is that you're facing. Another way to put it, this passage, the golden chain of salvation that we looked at a little bit earlier, is that all who are foreknown are predestined. All who are predestined are called. All who he called, he justified. All whom he justified, he glorified. Past tense, does not lose one. John chapter 10, verses 27 through 29 say, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. And they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Let me ask you this. So often we get caught up with these concerns that we can lose our salvation. What does the Word of God say? Now remember, as we've been going through here, this entire passage is an encouragement to us as we look back at that golden chain of salvation, no matter, back to verse 8, 28, no matter what we're going through, that it's as if it's past tense that God is so at work in the life of the believer that he will see us through these difficult times. If you look at this passage, does it say some of them might drift away? What's it say? It says, I give them eternal life. Jesus said that. And they shall never perish. Is temporary eternal life a contradiction of terms? Yeah. We're promised eternal life in the Bible. It says, I, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and nobody is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. You see how even during the hard times, we, we have the Lord there to encourage us. On July 6, 1415, John Huss made his final journey. 
John has done a lot of reading in the works of John Wycliffe and had studied some of the writings in which he had done and he had been very public in his ministry about those things that he believed. For these beliefs, John, John Huss was taken to be burned alive at the stake. What was it that he believed in? Well, we've got communion elements over here and you see the grape juice, some churches have wine, you see the bread over here as well. What John Huss believed is that these elements uh, although there's special meaning to them, are grape juice or wine and their bread. That they don't literally become the body of Christ during communion. And he took a stand on that, that they're not miraculously transformed where you're drinking the literal blood of Christ. He said, no, that's not true. What else did John Huss get in trouble for? The other thing is John Huss felt that every single Christian should have the ability to have the Bible in their own language. And they should be able to take the Bible home and to be able to study the Bible. John Huss was burned at stake for that. As he was being taken away to be burned, he's walking down and he was trying to talk to the people. And every time he tried to talk to the people, he, he, was, he, was, he wasn't allowed to. He was quieted down so he couldn't share. And he ended up, it was noon on this particular day, and he came up and as he got up to the stake, he kneeled down. And they put his hands in, in, in chains behind him, and, and they had a, a sooty uh, chain that was tied to his neck, which was tied to the pole around him. And as he's down on his hands and his knees, and he's beginning to pray, they begin to put the, the, the wood, and they begin to put the straw around him. And it goes all the way up to his neck. And as it gets up to his neck, they said, Okay, Mr. Huss, will you recant? Give you one more chance. John Huss said, I can't recant because it's wrong. And he said, I shall die with joy today in the faith in the gospel in which I have preached. And they lit the fire. And as the fire began to, to work its way up, he began to sing a song. And we've lost the melody of the song that he sang. But these are the words that he sang. Christ, thou son of the living God, have mercy on me. And he did it again. Christ, thou son of the living God, have mercy on me. And he continued to pray until he died at that moment. The church was so determined to get rid of any aspect of John Huss so that nobody would remember it. They took his clothes and they burned his clothes. They took the ashes that were left from him and they threw them into the Rhine River so that they would go away. But you know, today when we think back historically, we think of John Huss. We don't know who it was that was doing the, uh, the murdering of him during that time. What would give a martyr, what would give anybody so much courage and reason to stand in the faith, face of certain death and say, no, I hold to these truths of the scripture. And I'll tell you what, it's that golden chain of salvation. Remember verse 28? And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are at the call according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew before the creation of the world, he, pre he also predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. Whom he justified, these he also glorified. No matter what the world throws at you, in Christ we win. What are you facing today? And what kind of struggles do you see? You know, I mean, so often we get our faith shaken by things that we're going through. But passages like this aren't meant to divide the body of Christ apart. Passages like this are meant to encourage the body of Christ and bring assurance to them to stand fast in the faith. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. And that when we see passages like this, Lord, that have caused so much division over the years, Help us, Lord, to come to realize that, that there's, there's no part of your word that wasn't meant to be there, but that every part of your word was there for a purpose. And, Lord, that that was put there as an encouragement for me and every Christian, no matter what it is we're going through, to know that in Christ we win and to remain faithful. Lord, I pray today that if there are people here who haven't received Christ as their Lord and Savior, that they wouldn't leave here today without doing that. Lord, that they could have that same assurance of salvation in Christ and that it's by grace through faith. 
I ask, Lord, that, that if there's someone here who's never received Christ as their Savior, they might just pray a simple prayer like this. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God. I ask you to forgive me of my sins, of all the wrong things I've done to come into my heart and life. Lord, help me to be the kind of person that you desire for me to be. I give my life to you. And then, Lord, if there's anyone here today who's, who's listening or even listening on the radio today who's struggling with their own assurance of salvation, Lord, I, I just pray that somehow you would give them that comfort and peace of knowing that you are completely in control. And, Lord, that our salvation doesn't depend upon the way we feel at a particular moment, but our salvation depends upon grace and faith in the crucified Christ, the Christ who died for our sins. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah.